time to begin. The College of Complexes is in session, and we will be hearing from Jessica Serva uh, on the AUA, the Advocates for Urban Agriculture. Without further ado, our speaker, Jessica Serva. Thank you everybody for inviting us to come and present this evening at the College of Conference. Just that a little bit. Um, as Brown mentioned, uh, I'm with an organization called Advocates for Urban Agriculture. Um, you can see right up there, it tells a little bit about what we do. We're a coalition of individuals, organizations, and businesses um, that work together to expand and support at urban agriculture in the city of Chicago and the Chicago area in general. And that encompasses everything from people growing <laughs> tomatoes in their backyard, to community gardens, to school gardens, um, to commercial scale urban farms. Um, you got it. Yes, rooftop gardens as well. And we'll get into a little bit about that. My plan for the presentation was to talk a little bit about urban agriculture in general, talk a little bit about the history of urban agriculture in Chicago, and then kind of go over the scope of where we are today, tell you a little bit about my organization, uh, different ways for you all to get involved with urban agriculture if you're interested, and then of course have some type of questions. Did you have a question right over there? Why don't we hold the question? Okay. Okay. I just didn't know everyone can hear me okay and everything. Okay. Um, so if you take a look at this picture just to start out with, this is kind of a good representation of our vision statement. Take a look at a nice community, people walking down the street, nice green spaces. Um, and as it says there, we really envision a flourishing food system that promotes urban agriculture in Chicago um, as a driver of economic development, food security, environmental sustainability, and just quality of life for the residents of the city. Um, our work focuses on three main areas. Um, we work on urban agriculture policy at the city level and also we're getting a little bit into the state level right now. Um, we share information, resources, and best practices and we connect our network of the urban agriculture community in the city of Chicago. Um, going in to talk a little bit more about our policy uh, work, we're divided into three working groups. We only have two half-time paid staff. So we're really, our strength is in all of our members and all of our volunteers and everyone who participates in our working groups. Um, our advocacy working group works to build relationships with policymakers and promotes policy that um, is favorable for urban agriculture. As an example, I don't know if anyone saw it in the news just recently, um, two weeks ago, I believe. Um, the city passed provisions to the compost ordinance. We're really excited about that. Um, community gardens can now accept composting. It makes it a lot cheaper um, for businesses and farms to get the license um, that the city offers um, to those who are composting. So that's an example of our policy work. Um, here we're at the Illinois State Capitol for our uh, local food advocacy day. Um, our Connections Working Group, this is all about connecting everybody in the urban agriculture community and getting people involved who are kind of starting to think about maybe they want to start gardening or have some sort of interest in it. Um, our meetings, we hold quarterly gatherings that are always open to the public. Um, and free. Um, we've had a few. This is a, a picture from our third annual Urban Livestock Expo, which is held at the Chicago High School for Ag Agricultural Sciences. So if you're interested in starting to raise chickens in your backyard, or goats, or do beekeeping, 
um, which is all legal in the city of Chicago. We welcome you to attend that and get some ideas about how to keep your <coughs> neighbors happy and your animals healthy. Um, so that's kind of one of our project areas, offering activities like that. And we have our resources working group. Um, we're all about sharing information and making it available um, to anybody working in this area in the city of Chicago. Um, so we have a resource guide on our website, what I have here. Um, if anyone is interested, it's sort of a mini resource guide that we have that just lists some places that we'd recommend if you're interested in taking workshops or courses, if you're looking for a place for um, good good seed stock or to get your soil tested, this brochure is uh, a good place to start. So if you're interested afterwards, please make sure to take one. We also just recently um, launched our Chicago Urban Agriculture Mapping Project, which we put together with DePaul University and another organization called Neighbor Space. Um, the acronym is QUMP, it's very catchy. You can go to quamp.org. You can put in your uh, address if you'd like, and you know if people are interested, maybe we can take a look at that after the presentation. You can see it's integrated with Google Maps. There's about 800 um, sites that we have uploaded it there, so you can see if there's a garden nearby. If you're interested in starting to um, get involved with a community garden, or if you already participate. We're asking people to go ahead and put their information on there. And that really comes out of the um, <laughs> motivation for doing this and we'll see if it comes up in the question portion at all. Is Urban agriculture is fairly, um, well it's getting a big resurgent res resurgence recently and there's a lot of questions that remain about so how much is being harvested and how much area is being used for urban agriculture? You know, researchers are really starting to think about that and we find that we don't have too many of those answers. So we're hoping that um, the Chicago Urban Agriculture Mapping Project will help us do that. And so it's an open source site, anyone can join and add a site. Um, and yeah, move on from there wanted to talk a little bit about urban agriculture in Chicago in general. Um, it's not a new concept. Actually, the city led the nation in victory garden production during World War II. You know, this idea that uh, food from the farms had to go feed the trips. Be patriotic and grow your own food for your family. Um, this is actually the same site back in the 1940s and then today. This is the Peterson Garden Project um, over on Peterson Avenue. Um, you can see how it was cultivated back then and how it's um, come back around. I think um, I read a statistic, it said also about 14,000 children were involved at no, sorry. There were 14,000 sites in Chicago that were farmed during World War II by children uh, involved with the Chicago Park District. So imagine 14,000 sites. It must have been really very active uh, in comparison to what it is today, but we're moving back in that direction. Um, but why, why would we want to do that? Why is urban agriculture important or interesting um, to the city? What are the benefits? wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, of course, this is part of your ecological series, as uh, I think Charlie mentioned. Um, and so urban agriculture definitely improves the environment. It helps by um, decreasing stormwater runoff, turning those spaces that are um, had maybe been paved over, or um, the soil so compacted, turns them into sort of Nice drainage areas to keep that storm water from uh, running into the drains. Increases biodiversity. We recently had a, a, a talk with an entomologist who led us around some community gardens and just seeing the scope of insect biodiversity at different community gardens is <coughs> astounding. Um, of course, it reduces the amount of produce, uh, of greenhouse gases from the produce 
um, that is shipped in from other places all around the world. If you grow it in your backyard, um, those greenhouse gases aren't part of the equation anymore. Um, it also helps by improving soil quality. You know, Chicago has a long industrial history, and in many places, the soil is quite contaminated. Um, when urban agriculture moves back onto that site, that's one of the th first things that needs to be addressed through soil testing and <coughs> building up the soil by composting or um, remediation. There's a lot of different interesting ways to do that, including using mushrooms. So um, once the soil quality is improved, the rest of the environment is able to improve as well. Community economic development is also a big factor with urban agriculture. Um, many of the programs, I'm going to give some examples of specific um, programs, but many of them are driven um, as opportunities for employment or supplemental income or even just giving people free vegetables so that they can then designate those funds somewhere else. Uh, improves health, uh, lots of opportunities for physical activity, um, and of course, just yeah, the effect of eating more fruits and veggies enhances food security. Um, as I was talking with someone before the presentation, it's estimated that like one in six um, residents of Cook County are food insecure currently, so they don't necessarily know where their next meal is coming from. So. By having a, a garden nearby and encouraging people to get involved with gardening, it's one possible way um, to approach that issue. So urban agriculture in Chicago is very diverse. This photo starts to represent that. You can see like a large commercial scale farm, um, which are, when I say a large urban farm, it's of course nowhere uh, near the scope when we think of a large farm in other places and all the farming, all the um, gardening in Chicago is um, organic. It might not be certified as such because of um, either the time frame needed is longer than it, the site has been going or the funding required, but all the growing going on in the city and urban agriculture is using organic practices. So you can see that beautiful, um, diverse farm with all sorts of things growing on there, no monoculture there. Nice little greenhouse, and then this is actually a rooftop garden, which someone mentioned earlier. Um, at a restaurant called <laughs> Uncommon Ground Up on Devon. Um, but anybody really can get involved in urban agriculture, right? These are some small examples of how anyone can um, grow some of their own food at home, whether it's in lettuce and some water bottles or a little uh, window box there, or if you're able to have a little small plot in your backyard. Um, these are some examples of livestock that are being raised in the city. There are goat keepers in Chicago. There's a ton of beekeepers as well. Um, this is an example of a chicken coop. Um, we work pretty closely with an organization or a coalition called the Chicago Chicken Enthusiasts. They have a coop tour every fall. Uh, lots of chicken keepers throughout the, the city. And then there's also an example of an aquaponics facility, so um, raising some tilapia over there. Um, but from there it gets you know kind of bigger in scale. Um, these are some examples of community gardens. Your typical community garden, um, what people, a lot of people think of is kind of an allotment garden, like you pay maybe a fee at the beginning of the spring, um, and then you get your own little plot and you garden it, and maybe there are some community activities, concerts, barbecues, different ways to get involved. Um, some gardens also have sort of more communal styles where they all garden on certain uh, in certain areas together, or they're raising some. There's lots of. Um, there's quite a few projects that are sort of reserving. A, you grow a bed to give, and then you grow a, a bed full of vegetables for yourself, working in um, connection with food pantries, so addressing that food security issue that I mentioned before. I'm out. 
Um, school gardening is really thriving. Um, many of the sites on our Chicago Urban Agriculture Mapping Project are at Chicago Public School sites, helping to um, get kids outside, know where their food comes from, from preschool on up, to using it more as um, for a science classroom outdoors. There's quite a few projects in the city that are using urban agriculture as a tool for employment, as I mentioned. Um, that project on the top is from um, an organization called Heartland Alliance, and they have a project called FarmWorks that they have a, a training farm, and there's people that were formerly homeless and are looking to get back into the workforce um, or have experienced different barriers. Um, and they're at the farm part-time taking sort of math classes or professionalism <coughs> classes the other end of the time, other part of the time. Very similar at um, that one from an organization called Growing Home um, based in Inglewood. And then this young man is um, at an organization called Windy City Harvest, which is uh, part of the Chicago Botanic Garden. And they work with um, youth that have been involved in the justice system to um, as like sort of an alternative sentence, sentencing program. They're able to uh, work with their urban agriculture program, uh, program and have opportunities for employment afterwards. Um, so these are some examples of restaurant gardens, um, more on, um, yeah, the business side versus the community side. This again is that farm that I mentioned at Uncommon Ground. This one is a, a catering company called Big Delicious Planet, known as the greenest caterer in America, I think it is, located right here in Chicago over on uh, like Grand and Damon. They have this nice farm in there uh, behind their restaurant. And the other that one is um, Rick Bayless, celebrity chef, um, his garden. So they're able to definitely market that and uh, use urban agriculture as a draw to their uh, restaurants. Um, there's lots of other business ventures connected with urban agriculture. You might have mentioned that you might have noticed that a lot of the farms that I've mentioned so far are community gardens, school gardens, kind of more in the nonprofit sector. But there are businesses and or. Um, individuals trying to make a profit from urban agriculture. Um, the plant is located in the black back of the yards neighborhood and it's like a business incubator. There are lots of um, uh, sort of tenants in the plant that are, all have small businesses. Um, you can go down there and take a tour. And, um, yeah. Some people have gone and visited, it's a cool place farm outside, lots of interesting stuff going on inside. Um, in the top left, I guess, for me, uh, corner is a farm called Patchwork Farms. They're one of the few um, farms run by individuals that are trying to make a profit in the city of Chicago. They have a, a community supported agriculture program, or CSA, where you can sign up to get a, a box of vegetables from them every month if you'd like, delivered. Um, down on, this one is from a business, excuse me, called Farm Farm Here, located in Bedford Park, and they do indoor growing, um, hydroponic growing. So they have lots of greens and basil and salad dressings. If you ever shop at Whole Foods or um, some other sort of uh, grocery stores with that same mentality, you might see the products there. And uh, another example is the Chicago Honey Co-op. Um, see them at lots of different farmers markets. So lots of different for-profit models happening in urban agriculture as well. Um, just a few ideas if you're interested in this, and this is something uh, that you're motivated to be involved with. There's a few ways to do so. Of course, you can plant something at home, uh, whether it's on a windowsill or in, in your backyard. Um, you can join a community garden. 
can use our Chicago Urban Agriculture Mapping Project to find one near you. Um, signing up for a CSA, as I mentioned, that farm has and def different farms throughout the city um, to get vegetables uh, grown in Chicago. You can also shop at a farmer's market. Always talk to your vendors and see if you can spot any urban agriculture uh, growers. And then uh, check out those, some of those restaurants that um, are sourcing food locally. There are quite a few out there uh, beyond the ones that I mentioned. Um, we'd also love for anyone who's interested to get more involved with our organization, Advocates for or, uh, Urban Agriculture. Um, if you gave us your email on that thing, um, that um, clipboard going around, we can connect you to our network. We have a Google group with over, I think, 1,800 uh, subscribers, so there's all sorts of announcements about volunteer opportunities, workshops. If you have a gardening question, uh, you can post that as well. Um, if you're interested in getting even more involved, our working groups, which I mentioned earlier, have a lot of um, yeah. projects going on, and we're always looking for support um, from people who would well. like to uh, take on some responsibility there. Um, we have different events throughout the year, as I mentioned, and if you leave the email, you'll uh, be notified of those. Um, uh, volunteer, and you know, as with any nonprofit, we're always welcoming donations as well. Um, so it was about uh, it for what I had uh, planned out, but I know this is a, an active forum with lunch, so I'm sure someone might have a question, so we've got some time for that. All right, let's well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. The first oh, one. All right. Uh, all right. Dennis Nelson. I have the. I have tried to grow things at my own apartment. I live in a. Dennis supply. Nelson. And I ha don't have a green thumb. Like I, I've had a whole, maybe ten years ago, I had a house full of ferns that didn't really grow, and I had this little fireball in here called a cat that loved to eat and bat at those ferns. So how, what is the, now my cat's long deceased, but how do you handle a cat and ferns? Good question. Uh, I've heard plastic forks in the, in the planters might keep them away, or maybe you could plant a little thing of a catnip away from the ferns. Ferns aren't really my expertise, but um, the house plants, but I would say maybe try and distract the cat with something else or <laughs> deterrence. Yeah. I sprinkle the soil with pepper. The what? Pepper. Ah. Yes, Dennis. Yeah, great presentation. Thank you. My question's about the profitability of like vertical farms like the plant. I speak uh, here around every Earth Day, Earth Month on environmental issues, and a couple years ago, I was asked a question by a lady who's not here about that. And um, like the plant, and there's, I looked online about, the, it's supposed to be the largest vertical farm in the world, Bedford Park. And, and the question was pertaining to all the governmental incentives that go into setting up this place to begin with. And I responded, I wasn't really sure, but it might depend upon the time frame uh, by which, uh, how long the, uh, the vertical farm is in operation. Do you have any more specific information about this? I don't have any more specific information off the top of my head. No. Um, but I mean, of course, there's an initial investment and in what's happening in the long run. I mean, there are more and more vertical farms and indoor farms and hydroponic operations getting off the ground. Um, there's going to be a new one called Gotham Greens moving into Chicago, into the Pullman area. Um, another one called Garfield Produce and Garfield Park is also, um, you know, selling their products all over the city and seems to be so prospering. So. So, uh, I don't have any great dressing. I have a you know, hard data, but it seems like it's really that uh, form of farming is, okay. is proliferating. So. 
you know, because some have closed down and others have opened up. But I was thinking, after looking online, that possibly you have to wait for maybe a time frame of over maybe five, six years or so. Because you just can't look at a couple years that you have to look at maybe a longer time frame of five, six years or over. Yeah, I would Does say. Does that sound good? I mean, I would think, yeah, especially thinking about vertical farming and all the inputs that you need to get off the ground. Outdoor farming, you dump some dirt on the ground, put some seeds uh -huh. in, you know, the, the investment isn't as great. Whereas vertical farming, there's a lot more electronic equipment, you know, the real estate, the structure, everything that goes into it. Oh, thank you. And the reals. Yeah, we, we had a, a part of the tour as planned, and um, the tour guide, I believe, said they were having trouble getting legislation passed in the city that would make them actually legally able to sell their produce because it do, it's kind of a unique, it doesn't, you know, fall under grocery store, it's its, it's kind of own new entity. Do you know if any yeah. new legislation has been passed? It's a very, very relevant question that our steering committee has actually um, been talking about the last uh, last few meetings. Um, right now it's very confusing at the city level. Depending on the day and time that you ask, you're going to get a different answer. There's been multiple farms, multiple sellers that have gone and you know some have said you need a peddler's license. Some say oh there's nothing here you don't just you know you're fine. Just Or some have said you need a business license. So it's all a little murky. Um, I think there's some discussion in the urban agriculture community whether we want to push, do we need to be formalized, or maybe we just step back and nobody's watching and you know what do we do, you know, it's kind of like the urban livestock issue, there's nothing on the books um, about, yes you can have chickens, yes you can have bees, it just says you can't slaughter animals. And so, you know, you can, everybody just has taken that to mean we can raise animals. I guess I could have a cow. There's nothing there that says I couldn't, but uh, you can't slaughter your own animals. That's not to say there's lots of live poultry and butcher shop places around the city that will happily do so if you, your chicken uh, reaches its end of life phase. But yeah, that's still a very relevant issue that um, it's trying to be sorted out. Yeah, yeah. yeah when, when this organization started? When? And my the second question, are you vegetarian? Um, so the organization was started as more as a loose coalition of people. It's here in Illinois, it started or somewhere in the No, it, we're Chicago only. We're only based when? in Chicago. When we started it? in um, around 2000, but it, it was like starting like a like loose coalition. People oh. working on the are coming together and like, oh, we maybe could work on these projects together better. And um, the second question, am I a vegetarian? Uh, not personally. <laughs> um, so this organization established in Illinois, here in the city? In Chicago. Mm -hmm. in, yep. in 2010? Like I said, since it was kind of a coalition, it, oh, it was oh, like a little okay. fuzzy. Uh, around 2000, our first staff person started in 2012. And who is founder? Who, who started? Um, it was the like different employees at different urban agriculture organizations came together. And um, yeah, so there was not like one person. Yeah. All right. Uh, the uh, when I was a boy, there were a number of poultry stores. They called them poultry farms. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely remember one on uh, Chicago Avenue near Ashland, and there was uh, one I think on Western Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of them around, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure that they did their own slaughter in the place. So you're saying that it's against the law. No, I'm sorry, let me clarify. It's as an individual in your home, if you're raising a chicken at your home, you can't slaughter the chicken in your backyard. Oh, I see. Otherwise, yeah. if you're doing it commercially. But like, yeah, they have a license there. 
probably inspected, and there are still those shops around the city, and they can, yeah, they can take care of that, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the young lady seated over there. I'm yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, great, great work that you're doing. How are you? <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. If it, <coughs> I'm sorry. If it, oh my goodness. Look at all interfaith seated with grocery stores. Mm -hmm. um, so our organization um, right now is working on something called the local food uh, procurement policy and we're working on seeing other cities our size for example or you know around our size Los Angeles has this law uh, on the books that um, like city agencies like the schools everything in like city-wide cafeterias have to be sourced locally so right now we're kind of exploring how that could be feasible for Chicago um, and to do that work we're talking to uh, grocery stores are sort of like produce wholesalers, you know, like how much produce do we need to move and could we get that locally? Um, so at my organization specifically, that's how we work with um, uh, grocers and food distributors. Other organizations, so if I, I know like people that actually have farms or are working with um, you know, organizations that have farms, and they're, yes, also working on building those relationships to be able to, um, yeah, move, move, merchandise their produce and bring it to the store and, um, yeah, get it back into the community. There's also a lot that do uh, more direct sales, like farm stands, farmers markets are very popular. Um, other outlets for getting the produce to the community. Uh, the Greater Sh Greater Chicago Food Depository, um, I know, definitely sources a lot of the produce um, that's grown in the city as well from different programs. Yeah, but right. grocers, grocery stores are definitely involved in the urban agriculture movement. All right, I see Wes Wagger and Charlie Paydock. Uh, Wes, will you go first? Okay. What about uh, urban forestry? There are a lot more. Happen yeah, for sure. It's a little bit separate, but there is definitely um, discussion about urban orchards, um, especially like on the south side where there's a bit more space. Um, there's a great uh, organization working on urban orchards, and spe specifically in the Washington Park and Hyde Park area. Um, Cam Isaiah Israel, uh, they're Synagogue, their social justice arm has a, a food and sustainability um, program, and they're working on doing an edible orchard. So, um, yeah, we don't focus so much on like forestry in general, but another organization that does is called Open Lands, and they're you know they do lots of tree plantings around the city, um, and I think have an urban forestry department. Charles. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. It's Jessica. Jessica. Granted, you can have a square foot garden, but how many of these suburbanites with these big haciendas where you can have real gardens, 8 by 10, 12, actually have them, or do they just go to these? The big thing now is to go to farmer's market if you've got an issue. Do they do any? I mean, I don't have exact numbers. Um, anecdotally, I can tell you, yeah, there's definitely um, like people that come to our events in the city that are from the suburbs, and there are some suburban sites on our um, urban agriculture mapping project. Um, I think there are definitely uh, lots of suburbanites doing backyard gardening. Of course, you know, that's also got a lot of lawn to mow. Yeah. I think our society is still very stuck in that uh, idea of having a lawn. and But uh, got to start somewhere. And even if they're not gardening, going to the farmer's market is supporting sustainable agriculture in another way. You know, you got to meet people where they're at. Not everybody's going to pick up a shovel tomorrow. So if people can start shopping at farmer's markets, that's, that's a move in the right direction. So. 
Yeah. I'd like to know just a little bit about your background and how you got interested in uh, this organization and, and just how does, uh, you know, just a little bit more background on how you got interested in this field and what drew you to this organization. Easy question. I got that one covered. Um, <laughs> uh, my background is I started doing more environmental work. Um, I studied a master's in natural resources and sustainable development, and I was working in Central America, um, specifically with coffee farmers in Guatemala doing alternative income generation, generating projects, and talking about how to plant in between the coffee rows uh, different plants that might be able to use for cosmetics or sold in, in their markets. Um, but I'm from Chicago originally. It was time to move back to Chicago uh, for some time to be closer to family. And I was thinking about, like, what is sustainable development in Chicago? What does that mean? Um, you know, I think urban agriculture really hits the nail on the head. It's able to improve the environment, make green spaces, provide economic opportunity for communities that um, are definitely hurting. Um, yeah, that's my motivation in getting involved. Okay. Andy Anderson? Yeah. Uh, Paul, how, how did you get a job in Guatemala? Or, or were you on the Peace Corps? Or uh, was, was, was your family fund an additional couple of years of educational oh, no. travel? Or, <laughs> no, or what? how do you get a gig like that? Um, well, my master's program was actually uh, in Coast, half in Costa Rica, half in Washington, D.C., half at the U.N. University for Peace. So I was in Central America. Got an internship in Guatemala, made connections, got a job at a nonprofit. So it's an internship to get started mm -hmm. yep. in college. Yep. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Charles. Yeah, Jessica, the, the occasions I've done backyard gardening were, <laughs> were arduous endeavors, to say the least. Uh, and I think a lot of people will underestimate the toil and sweat that goes into growing food. Yeah. Is this common among your these city folk? Uh, yeah, I think it's it can be a hard adjustment sweater. to make, especially um, if you work with kids and kids that have been in the city and aren't used to getting outside, even. I work with adults in my other job on an urban farm and getting uh, adults out and seeing bugs and being okay with bugs. being dirty and sure. yeah, um, but I think, you know, it, people get used to it and I think there's also a lot of people um, in society that are getting frustrated with sitting beneath fluorescent lights at a computer eight hours of the day, so people, some people that volunteer or are gardening at community gardens really appreciate that hard work and actually feeling physically active um, as opposed to sedentary you know, sitting behind the computer all day. So yeah, it's hard work. <laughs> it is uh, to grow food. You gotta dig a lot of dirt, move a lot of stuff, bend over <laughs> and squat and kneel. And, but, yeah. Okay, Linda and uh, the uh, people who have just come in, uh, if you could raise your hand, too, if you have a question. Okay. Well, I, I just wondered if you know um, my heroine, um, local celebrity, Jean Nolan, who wrote From the Ground Up. She's done so much. Um, mm -hmm. And um, if you'd care to, like, share anything about her that you know of. And then there's also um, a fellow who goes around with his truck on a daily basis and picks up garbage from restaurants mm -hmm. and, and recycles it as compost. So yeah. if you'd like to elaborate on any of that. Yeah. Um, so the first person you mentioned, Jean Nolan, she has a, a company based in, you know, um, um, yeah, I think something. about there on the north northwest side um, called the Organic Gardener. And she helps those suburbanites that don't know what to do with their backyard, but have all this backyard and are interested in doing that, or people in the city as well, um, to set up a, a food producing garden, how to make the beds, brings in the soil, gives them a plan. Um, so doing great work for um, the 
people that uh, you know they're they're working for to build that garden. She has a great book. She actually just donated. We just had a big event in September. We had a grown in Chicago urban agriculture showcase, a summer soiree it was called, and we had a silent auction. She donated a copy of her book in one of those consultations and was very generous to do so. Um, the other person you mentioned is Ken Dunn. He is connected with City Farm, um, the resource center. It's kind of one thing. City Farm is located at Clybourne and Division. And as you mentioned, he has a, a big truck and he picks up food from Green City Market in Lincoln Park at the end of the day, the farmer's market. He picks up from the University of Chicago cafeteria, I believe, and they compost it all um, and then sell it back. So um, I mentioned that composting ordinance, they're actually one of the few. Um, big uh, generators of compost in the city. Previously, even though they're a nonprofit, they had to pay three thousand dollars for a three-year permit. We got it. We were able to work with our coalition to get that down to three hundred dollars that the city will now charge. So we're all pretty happy about that. But yeah, it's a great project to us. Well, just one more question. I had a friend of mine who was involved in urban agriculture. He used to grow the specific plant that required heat lamps and everything else, and the law enforcement shut him down. And he, he, his main defense was, "I'm just farming and raising a crop." <laughs> it's not legal in Colorado. Any thoughts? Uh, I don't think there's an official organizational position on that. <laughs> yeah, no comment. Just uh, Charles. Yeah, Jessica, whenever I see someone in my family or friends or co-workers eating some produce, I always ask them, was it harvested by United Farm Workers or by children? Do you ever get into issues of food supply like that? Yeah, that's actually a lot of, um, I mentioned our work on food procurement. Um, yes. This is definitely an issue. Vanilla and chocolate whipped cream? Uh, yeah, and uh, the kind of stems from that and looking, taking a more local focus. It's led by uh, another person in the coalition uh, associated with, I think it's called the uh, yeah. food chain like that workers, yeah. um, who are very conscious of that issue. And, you know, definitely, I guess a, another benefit of urban agriculture is you can definitely be more aware of where your food is coming from in that way as well and who, who picked it and how they're being treated. Uh, on the job. Uh, I have a question myself. Oh, yes. Yeah, another question, and that is, have you, had, have you run into any opposition that you had to overcome, and who is that, or what groups is that coming from? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Actually, we were talking a little bit before the presentation, and luckily I don't think there has been like a very concerted big opposition. Um, there's been you know, on some different issues, um, different challenges that we've had. Um, for example, there's this thing we call the Chicago Weed Ordinance, which says that the weeds in your yard, any plantings in your yard, can't be over the average of 10 inches. You know, people are trying to now grow food a lot more creatively, whether maybe it's in their front yard and the streets and sanitation department who are very well trained to come by and give fines or mow down somebody's lovely garden. Um, so that's kind of like an ongoing project is to work with the city's departments. Um, I wouldn't say they're like opposing us, but definitely like still requiring um, some work on that relationship to, you know, eliminate that problem. Um, other opposition, I think it's just sometimes it's based on uh, lack of knowledge. People like, I don't want a farm next to me that's going to like cause a lot of rats. It's more like kind of neighborhood opposition um, than more like a concerted like uh, effort of, you know, a united front of opposing urban agriculture. Sit. You have yeah, um, when you go to the supermarket <coughs> or a fruit store or whatever, 
the prices are very high. And um, let's say a group that you're with or something that sells this produce, is the prices a lot lower than in the commercial uh, venue? Um, on average, I would say no, it isn't a lot cheaper. Um, part of that is knowing where your food came from and the wages that are being paid to the workers that pay it. Um, giving a good living wage in the city of Chicago is probably more expensive than, you know, paying somebody, a migrant worker, you know, per pound that they're able to pick throughout the day. Um, so that's a factor. Um, yeah, so unfortunately not, but I mean, there's a lot of organizations subsidizing and like with the, especially uh, nonprofits that value the fact that the produce is staying in the community, they're setting their um, prices low or at comparable um, to the grocery store if you are in that community. If you go to Whole Foods and buy, you know, uh, food from Farm Tier, that giant vertical farm, then I don't think you'll see the comparison. But if you're going and buying it on the farm in the community, then it's, it's a lot cheaper. If you're growing it yourself in a community garden, it's very much cheaper. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. I have a question. And that is, my church has a garden and on the rooftop and uh, an aviary uh, on the roof. Uh, uh, I think that, that the, uh, the mostly students uh, who live in the parish uh, parsonage are, are uh, uh, they're cooking meals and distributing them uh, to the you know, farmer's market on Sundays, uh, Sunday afternoon. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, what sort of uh, troubles or hassles they may be getting in. To <laughs> yeah, in what way? Well, the bees might sting somebody, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, well, I think the food, if it's freely distributed, uh, and, and we do have a, a, a Sunday evening meal that's free, mm -hmm. uh, but if any of the produce that they grow there, uh, it, 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 right. I understand. It's a, a good question. Um, so there's a few a few things. First of all, as far as like the bees, the fact that they're on the roof that kind of protects them from you know getting any passerbys upset about you know the bees. But um, as far as like preparing it for a free meal, there's this thing called the. Um, there's a, um, oh, Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act. And if the food is prepared in good faith, it's not like, oh, I know all these things are rotten, but we're still going to put them in the sauce. But if it's prepared in good faith and shared with the community, then there's no liability. There's also most farms practice, um, uh, there's something called gap practices, good agricultural practices. A lot of the larger farms in Chicago are oh, certified nice. through the USDA. Yeah to be able to know how to handle the food, wash it, keep it at the correct temperatures before it goes to market or is widely distributed. So hopefully your yes. students at your church won't be getting in too much trouble. Charles, uh, how much time do we have, by the way? Right now, the... Uh, another half hour. 7.30. About 7.30, we have another half an hour with questions. Sure, but okay, Charles. Yeah, don't cut us short. No, the growing season's just started, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, what is your candid opinion of agribusiness, or do you think free market libertarian capitalism is beneficial to us in terms of food supply? Um, no, I don't think it. I mean, if you see, I think urban agriculture is a lot of a reaction to, you know, uh, large far large scale farming in the rest of our state realizing that the products that are generated from soybeans and corn aren't food that are actually healthy or feeding uh, the city's population well. Um, you know, it's cheaper to, I think everybody, this issue has become so 
thankfully more popular, uh, you know, a bag of Cheetos is cheaper than an apple. And I think that's something the communities like feel very, um, like, very strongly these days. They realize that that's an issue, and I think urban agriculture is kind of a pushback um, to that model. Um, I was, uh, we used to have what was called the uh, Maxwell Experimental Natural Garden Nature Preserve, which uh, combined all these concepts, but was uh, destroyed by the University of Illinois. <coughs> Yeah, it's good when you can like make a, a more holistic learning place on the farms. And I think a lot of the urban farms in Chicago do offer, you know, school tours and different different programs so that you know people can come out and um, take that in. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Linda and then uh, LP. Yeah. Um, what do you know about organic certification? I have a friend who, said, who is a professional gardener, and she says there really is no standard, standard standardization. And I mean, it's like just because you go to a farmer's market doesn't mean necessarily you're going to get organic food. Is there, and there are no inspectors going around to make sure you're not using herbicides or pesticides. Right. So. So there is official certification. You can see like on lots of products in the supermarket or um, yeah, you can see there's a seal, it's green and white, it says USDA organic. And that certification is done by different certifying agencies. Organic certification is a very long and expensive pro uh, process. You know, your farm has to be doing organic practices for I'm not too familiar, but maybe let's say five years or something before you can get the certification, because that's the time maybe it needs for all the synthetic chemicals to biodegrade. Um, as far as, you know, because it is very long and expensive process, many farmers choose not to get certified organically. But that's where if you go to a farmer's market, talking to your farmer is really important. Like ask them, you know, are you organic? And then I might say, well, we're not certified, but we use organic principles. Um, and that's true of many of the farms in Chicago. I think only farms by an organization called Growing Home are certified in the city, but um, I work on a farm in my other job. We do all organic farming. I think every, most community gardens, like it's in their set of rules, like you can only, you know, there's no pesticides or fertilizers here, so. I think a lot of the growing being done in Chicago is organic, whether or not it's certified with the seal of approval. Juliana. So what do you think about hybrid vegetables? I don't want to be on camera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like hybrid um, vegetables, for instance, you're going to the vegetable store, sometimes you see like yellow tomatoes, mm -hmm. and it's like, it says like, uh, GI hybrid, excuse my English. Mm -hmm. It's no. like third language. So, so what do you think about? I guess it's ridiculous. Um, so I think there's an important distinction between hybrids <coughs> and heirlooms it's and GMO. Yeah. Actually, hybrids is can just select. So let's say, well, um, imagine a hybrid. You can kind of think uh, it's kind of like a genetic selection. Imagine like you have a dog and you want it uh, like, you know, you keep your German Shepherd, like you want it to find a mate you, to make it big too, but it's, it's still natural. It's just too, it's just selecting for certain traits. So, so or there's seeds, for example, that um, like these yes. heirloom seeds, so you might see these crazy tomatoes, different colors, but they're just, just different strains of tomatoes that um, so have been lost over the years. So I, you, uh, 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 you, I mean, I think there's nothing wrong with hybrid vegetables. I think it gets when people, so like a hybrid vegetable, I can tell you why. Um, you think, imagine the beefsteak tomato, this nice, round, perfect tomato that you see in the grocery store. Why has that been selected? Because it can, 
It has a very hard outer skin. It can be transported far from California or the southern United States. It takes a long time to ripen, so from the time it gets from Chicago, or from the southern United States to Chicago, it's still ripe. So that's why these like big, beautiful, although sometimes tasteless tomatoes I, I get I here. Be, but be these very little, suspicious. I will be very suspicious. So, but these other varieties are just as much of a tomato as this big, beautiful, tasteless, sometimes round tomato is. But they just are selected for different traits. This has been going on. This is how, you know, the relative of the corn is like this weird, small little plant. But over the generations, we've selected the seeds that are the best for a different, oh, I like that color, so I want it to be this, and it's like a natural process. When you start to talk about GMOs and genetically modified, and that a scientist has gone in and altered the DNA of the seed, that's something we don't know about. That's brand new. That's where people are talking about all the risks, like why, why are humans eating this? We have no, but seeing a hybrid is different than GMO. So yes, those are two separate things. Because oh. I guess farmers cannot mix up with nature. It's, it's, it's not right and it's not good for health. So leave them alone. Like people have gardening. <gasps> you see sometimes like even like you go in your bus. Oh, beautiful natural tomatoes. It's, it's nothing mixed. It's supposed to be natural. Come on. it's So again, you against them or for, or you don't care? Uh, well, I think hybrids are just... Um, I, I am against. It's okay. not supposed to be. Okay. Right. That's not supposed to be natural. I have a question about uh, that, too. Thank you. Because I noticed that the organic uh, vegetables are... The stores charge more for. And uh, uh, while I know... Uh, I have no stock in Monsanto. Uh, I uh, really uh, <laughs> uh, it it's all worth that much more, uh, and, uh, it, and how can a tomato or anything else uh, that I'm going to eat be inorganic? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, it's all organic if you want to talk like it in a chemical chemistry type term, but organic has come to mean not using, um, you know, a certain set of uh, petroleum-based fertilizers and uh, pesticides and things like that. And I mean, the question about cost goes back to Charles's question about the economy and um, we've set up the system, we've rigged the system to make those big farms more profitable and um, you know we've subsidized the use of fertilizers and pesticides for so long that organic shouldn't be more expensive because you're doing more by hand, you're doing more natural methods, but at this point in time we've kind of stacked against uh, the deck against it. But hopefully, if people uh, continue to increase the demand for those organic goods, hopefully the prices will fall. And if you know us as citizens and as groups, if we advocate for a policy that takes less of um, the focus off subsidizing, you know those inputs that put the cost down on you the mean there is hope. <laughs> I like to think so, you know. <laughs> you know, I think uh, some people, some people like to think every time you eat, you're voting, right? So you got to choose what you eat, and uh, by doing that, you're supporting one form of agriculture or another. Um, the uh, the general feeling among climate scientists is that we have to have a a World War II like motivation of green technologies across the board, you know, to avoid a catastrophic climate change. How, how, among the people you work with, what's the sense of urgency about, you know, this being one of the cornerstones of a total green revolution to get off fossil fuel? Now, anybody thinking along those lines? And, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think personally, like in the community that's working on urban agriculture, that's, you know, the focus. Um, it's also, I think this is an opportunity to work on this issue that is people-centered. I think some of the 
criticism that the environmental movement gets is like, save the polar bears, save this. It's like, well, people in China need jobs, and that's why they're not folding, you know. Um, but I think urban agriculture bridges that gap in many ways, and that it is very much can be people-centered. It's helping people to stay healthy. It's helping people um, to find jobs, but it's also bringing green spaces into the city. It's cutting down fossil fuels for the transportation uh, of the food and the inputs like synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. So, I mean, I think a lot of people are overwhelmed, and at least if in the day-to-day -day I can go out and work on the farm, then you know I'm, I'm doing my part. I just have a curiosity. I know you've been involved with the urban agriculture. What is your favorite agricultural plant that you like to either plant or eat, or do you have a favorite that you like to work with? So this season, I would say, um, I just discovered this plant last year. I never seen it, I never tasted it. It's called a ground cherry. Have you guys ever seen these? They're like, um, they look like a tomatillo. They're in these husks that you grow. They're like little cherry tomatoes, but they're sweet, and they taste like nothing, and you'll never, I've never seen them in a store before, so. That's like a fun one that you know you have to grow to be able to enjoy, and it, it tastes really great. <laughs> so right now, I would say ground cherries. Just that, uh, real. Speaking of uh, hot fruits, have you ever heard of a pawpaw? Mm -hmm. I don't know why we don't have them in the store. They're like a local Michigan. Uh, yeah, they're native. Or not native. native. Well, I don't yeah, know they're if they're native, native, but they, they grow in Illinois as well. But mm -hmm. they're it's a wonderful fruit. Yeah, and that's connected to that urban or orchard question. I think there is more uh, effort to try and plant those native fruit trees. Um, have you ever heard of Midwest Fruit Experience? <coughs> I have not. Well, look them up. They're uh, just about fruit trees. It's a large enough organization. Cool. Thanks. Then there's also railroad track wild yeah, asparagus. Yeah, I'd just like to follow up on the uh, issue of GMO, generally um, genetically modified foods. And I heard that Monsanto and maybe other country uh, companies that are doing a lot of things <coughs> have secretly bought up a number of the seed companies. And so you don't know necessarily when you buy a, a packet of seeds whether or not it's actually um, organic or whether it's been manipulated and genetically modified. And my question is, have you heard about this? Do you know uh, of any source that you can go to to check and see which food uh, seeds, particularly of the common brands that you would find maybe at a hardware store, are okay and which have been uh, <laughs> tampered with? Well, I wouldn't put it past Monsanto. That seems like something that they might do. Um, but actually in this, um, we have a whole seed section. And there are definitely like a few very long-standing um, seed outlets. Both There's a few online listed here. Um, Johnny's Seeds. Uh, seed Savers Exchange, there's um, High Bush Mowing Company Seeds, there's lots of these seed companies which have been down, uh, around for centuries that are very focused and very specific about heirloom seeds, collecting the seeds from generation to generation, having that focus. Um, so that's where I would order my seeds from. I would also say if you're really concerned about that, don't go to Ace Hardware, don't go to Home Depot, go to a smaller local garden center, especially there's a few listed in uh, in this brochure, Christy Weber um, Garden Supplies on Grand, there's Gethsemane Garden Center on Clark, um, and the people there are more of the inclination um, that are interested in organic seeds and talk to the people there and ask them. Um, for just as more a, trusted sources. That, someone also told me that some of the plants, like flowery plants that you would buy, particularly at the garden center, are genetically modified and are bad for the bees. Bees, yes. This is an issue. Um, there's a class of chemicals called neonicotoids. I might, I might be missing a syllable there. Neonicotoids, let's say. 
Um, and these new plants are sort of infused with them. And so instead of like spraying a pesticide on these plants, it's actually in, in the plant's tissue as it's cultivated. Um, it eventually does wear off, which is good. So like within two or three years, I think, or maybe even after the first season, depending on the plant, that chemical dissipates and is out because, you know, the plant is creating new tissue uh, and those chemicals have worn off. But that season that any bee is visiting them, they're across the board pesticides. So, you know, while you might be trying to detract um, you know, a ladybug from munching on the plant, you know, if a honeybee visits, then they're also going to get the same fate. Okay. So, yeah. Let's go to rebuttals, Brom. Okay, it's time for rebuttals. And what are the rules for rebuttals? Right. Let's first let's thank our speaker. You get you get the last word. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, um, if you seats are ready to give your rebuttal, you might want to take one of the seats next to our speaker. Um, and I got it. Only I, when you're ready. <laughs> Only so, because we have other people. How many people do have some remarks to make to the rest of us on the uh, high price of beans in China and uh, the, especially the urban areas? Uh, or, yes, uh, David, Charles, uh, Tim, uh, Gene. I think you've got about 30 minutes apiece. No. Uh, no. <laughs> We're going to go for it. Uh, I guess it's a little less than that. Uh, oh, six how minutes. about uh, up to six minutes? And some of you may be inspired later. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, first, uh, Seth Cohen. Let's get rolling. Uh, I know in Detroit, uh, they used to have about 1,800,000 people living there, and now it's about maybe 700,000 or something like that. And there's a lot of space there, and it's not being taken up. And a lot of the people that live there don't have no source for food. The food stores are so far away and if you don't have a car, the transportation is just awful there. So they started doing urban farming and started um, selling food in that, in that direction. And um, it's a good thing, I think, because you know what type of food you're getting. And if you go in the supermarkets, a lot of the stuff is sprayed with chemicals, insecticides, herbicides, and like she said, they use uh, petroleum as far as the soil is concerned. I didn't understand that part. So you're getting a lot better quality of food. Like the price might be the same, but it's still a lot better quality. And if you go to Whole Foods, well, you shouldn't call it Whole Foods. You should call it Whole Check. That's, that's what it really is. You can spend your whole check just getting by. And it's uh, uh, something that a lot of people just cannot afford. And the same thing is happening in Cuba now. Nobody's talking about it. But they're doing a lot of urban farming there. And another thing, when you do urban farming, uh, you, you're lessening your uh, carbon footprint. Because a lot of these things are grown, let's say, in South America. For instance, you go and get some grapes, and it comes from Chile. Or if you get a, come and get a watermelon, comes from Mexico, or other uh, fruits and vegetables, and these are grown on these agribusiness farms, and they don't particularly care what they uh, put in there, as far as the crop is concerned. What's, uh, what their interest is uh, a good profit, and that's all they're really interested in. 
And then you ship and get real long distances. And the urban footprint is real large because you, you used to go out of uh, fossil fuels to get it from one place to another. So that's a, that would be another advantage to that. And uh, generally, it's a good thing. And we have a lot of spaces in Chicago. If you go, if you go to the south side, I haven't been there maybe for a number of years, maybe three, four years. But if you go like at, down 47th Street, it used to be all filled up with uh, buildings. People were living there. But now what you see is a lot of empty lots. So you could be growing a lot of things in those areas there. And then the people there, like I said, they don't have no source for getting this food. So you could have it right there. If you go on the west side, they haven't been there for a long time, it would probably be the same thing. So uh, I think it's a, an advantage and it's something to look forward to. I think it's uh, becoming the, the next wave as far as uh, producing food is concerned. Yeah. Uh, if a person is in favor of capitalism, it doesn't make him a capitalist. A capitalist is somebody who engages in business to make money and that's a capitalist. But people who are in favor of capitalism, who just work in a factory or something, they uh, are merely uh, in favor of a particular philosophy. Uh, and with that in mind, I want to mention that a lot of people here probably would think that I uh, would be against uh, this uh, urban agricultural thing because that it uh, uh, maybe um, uh, goes against a lot of the big farms and all that sort of thing. But the, the fact is that I very much support uh, urban agriculture because I believe that competition makes things better. And uh, anyone else who is knowledgeable and supports capitalism uh, will agree with me on that. Uh, if you go to Chinatown and you ask just about anyone who has a business there, uh, do you think that there are too many businesses around here? They will say yes. It, uh, it's hard to make a living because that there's too much competition. But the fact is, competition makes things better. It means a lower price for the consumer, which is at the bottom end. And uh, it is a, a, um, a good thing all the way around for everybody. And it's also good for those who are competing with one another because uh, people say, hey, there's so many places over there in Chinatown. Let's go to Chinatown. And we can choose whatever we want when we get there. So this way, uh, the fact that there are so very many it, uh, is good for even the people who are competing with one another who are there. Uh, just by virtue of the fact that there are so many there that are competing. Uh, I talked to a person from, I think, Germany or Austria, and they talked about a, a place that they said there are something like uh, 500 taverns, all of them practically right next to each other. I think this was in Luxembourg or something. And they said, and they all make money. So competition definitely is uh, not only good for the end user consumer, but it's also very good for those who are doing the competing. So uh, with that in mind, and uh, with the idea that it also adds to convenience because of person can say, I think I'm going to buy some watermelon from the Mexican guy I see over here with a station wagon and, and, uh, and some watermelons and so on. Or I'm going to stop off at this farmer's market or whatever and buy it. I don't have to make a special trip. I can buy things on my way home 
to or from work, and that's good for me, the consumer. So I absolutely support uh, uh, consumer farming. Uh, or what do you want to call it, Agricul city or agricultural farming. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. All right, Dennis, you're next. You're next, Dennis. Yeah, come on. I love My name's uh, Dennis Nelson. Thanks, Jessica, for a great presentation. We need more of these kind of presentations here at the college. Urban farming is one of the most exciting, innovative, and relevant aspects of modern agriculture. Whether you're talking about neighborhood-run urban fruit and vegetable gardens or commercial industrial-scale integrated vertical farms in the Chicago area has both, urban farming can provide both jobs and income for poor <coughs> inner-city residents. Chicago urban farming can also supply desperately needed fresh produce in what have been called food deserts. It's not that these particular areas on Chicago's south and west sides don't have any food. There are plenty of fast food restaurants. What the poor residents in these food deserts desperately need are fresh vegetables and fruits. I'm now going to turn to a hot topic which has attracted a great deal of attention recently, which Jessica just barely touched on, and that's protecting our essential pollinators. Bees are the most important single group of pollinators. Everybody usually thinks about introduced and managed populations of European honeybees, but there are also ground nesting and tunnel nesting native bee species. Our native pollinators also include wasps, butterflies, moths, flies, and beetles. All these pollinators should be saved because of their crucial role in providing the foods and beverages that we enjoy. About one in three mouthfuls of our food and drink require the presence of a pollinator. Uh, Susie gave me a complimentary bowl of the delicious cream of broccoli soup. Broccoli depends upon pollinators. Carrots, squash, strawberries, blueberries, apples, cherries, uh, blackberries, uh, boysenberries, uh, the list goes on. The economic value of insect pollinated crops in America during 2003 was estimated to be between 18 billion and 27 billion dollars. Much more pollinators provide an ecological service that is essential to the health of our environment. When well, my undergraduate years, my favorite biology class in college was the invertebrates, otherwise known as invertebrate zoology during my sophomore year. For environmental studies seminar, when a college senior, I did a presentation about integrated pest management, biological pest control. I'm a longtime leader in invertebrate conservation. For years, I've been on the cutting edge of crucial ecological agricultural issues such as pesticide use and pollinator protection. For example, I've been extremely active in the campaign to ban all uses of a class of toxic chemical insecticides called neonics, which was briefly mentioned, which have been shown to kill bees and other pollinators. And that was included in my recommendations to the President's White House Interagency <coughs> Pollinator Health Task Force. Also because of public pressure from pollinator activists like myself, Lowell's has joined Home Depot in phasing out all neonics from their lawn and garden supplies. We are now working on getting true value in ACE to also stop selling these hazardous bee-killing pesticides. Because of their lower toxicity to mammals, neonics have been widely embraced by various agricultural and landscape industries. Neonics mimic the toxins found in nicotine. They are applied as seed and root treatments, foliar sprays, and trunk injections. That was what Ruthie mentioned earlier. <laughs> Toxic chemicals are then absorbed and transported by the vascular system throughout the plant. These hazardous chemicals are sequestered in flower nectar and pollen. Now, nectar feeding and pollen feeding native beneficial insects, such as lacewings, parasitoid wasps, and lady beetles, the lady beetles were mentioned, uh, might be poisoned as a result, but what's the really big deal about this? See, these native beneficial predatory and parasitic insects help control pests, so neonics simply cannot be integrated into conservation biological control. Let's wrap this up by getting back to Chicago urban farmers and what role they can play in protecting our essential pollinators. Preserving, enhancing, or restoring wildflower-rich foraging habitats 
is the most significant help that Chicago urban farmers can take for bees, butterflies, and other flower visitors. In addition, Chicago urban farmers can provide nesting sites for native bees, host plants for butterflies, and overwintering refuges for other insects. When these basic habitat essentials are provided, Chicago urban farmers should manage them in ways which will make sure that there is longer term productivity. Pollinator conservation can be used as a way of achieving a more sustainable Chicago urban environment, which Jessica pointed out greatly. And this is a no-brainer that our neighborhood-run urban vegetable and fruit gardens can also be turned into ideal pollinator havens. And we can also use the green spaces were mentioned. We've got green spaces scattered throughout Chicago. The Chicago River Corridor, urban trails, golf courses, and city parks. We also have plenty of other areas to work with here in Chicago. Uh, business and school campuses, green roofs, highway and railroad rights of way, utility easements, industrial sites, and brownfields. So I'll be more than happy to discuss this with anybody afterwards. And Jessica, again, thanks for a terrific presentation. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm Beverly Walter, and I want to thank Jessica and those wonderful comments that Dennis just made because uh, what we need to be thinking about, of course, is the future and sustainability not only of our, our species but of the whole planet. And when, that, when we're starting to talk about GMO foods, then obviously we are coming to a point where it is very, very serious because this uh, GMO... Um, the plants, the uh, you know the the seeds and the pollen and so forth spreads to other crops, and that means that other crops are contaminated. Uh, not only uh, do they are they we finding out how dangerous those are for our own body. We've been lied to, of course, and told that they're perfectly safe and they're no different from regular plants. But studies are showing that that is that is a deception, and so. The efforts of the urban agriculture is absolutely, uh, I mean, it's, it's just very, very exciting to hear about. And the other aspect I want to touch briefly is the aspect of water. Because, uh, of course, whatever we eat, whatever we drink is going to go back into the water. And we now know that mother's milk uh, uh, in, uh, in animals or uh, in human beings uh, is contaminated with pesticides and insecticides and, and fertilizers. Uh, the fetus, for example, is being exposed to this. We cannot risk playing around with our future. And so initiatives like this are something that I think maybe all of us consider having how active we, what role we might take in, uh, in furthering this, whether it's buying, whether it's growing, whether it's supporting, whether it's uh, talking to our, uh, our alderman or whatever. And uh, the other real quick thing is the importance of water, because of course all of these plants and us need water. And the uh, insecticides, the pesticides, the oil residues, because we need renewable energy, the nuclear radioactivity, because, because uh, there are uh, periodic uh, releases of radioactivity, all of those things are going to our water. And so the group that I'm with, Kapow, is focusing on these issues. And I'd be happy to uh, give one of these to each one of you. We're trying to, we're trying to make people aware of this. Our media isn't doing it. And so if anyone wants to help by taking a couple and passing out to your friends, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right, Charlie. We got six minutes. We got a lot of time. I thought we're early. Yeah, we are. We got a lot of time here. So I, he said I got 30 minutes. I'm going to talk, take advantage of this. All right, let's thank our speaker once again for bringing your nice PowerPoint and for your activities here. I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. My experience with produce goes back to my experience as a young man. Gene? working for a number of years on the produce market on 13th Street there. 
Uh, I worked all through high school and in the produce market. I remember I used to get one, I used to try to one piece of fruit joint per day, so I'd pick like a peach that was about like this big, you know. But um, I think, eclectically, I'd say everyone should be required to grow something. Yes. I think it's, it's, there's an existential experience to this. And it's a learning, learning experience. But I think everyone should be required to grow everything. Uh, right out of college, I found myself, someone, I was in a project like yours, but I found myself a city boy on, on a dairy farm in a rural area. And may, took advantage of the situation to absorb all I could about modern agriculture. Uh, the guy I worked with, he claimed he was such a good, such, so good at growing crops that if you were real quiet, you could hear the, the corn pop. It would grow a little bit, you know, if you were real quiet. I returned to the city, but still continue growing things. I, I was into house plants and had as many as 200 at one time. I'm always amazed, I always like these plastic ones they have here. Um, I'm still pursuing this topic for some reason, I don't know why, at the end of August. I'm going again, I like to go to state fairs and take up the agricultural things, and I'm pursuing sidelines like learning the history of tractors, which... <laughs> And yeah, I'm always amazed at state fairs, they have these world's largest pumpkin displays. I don't know if any of your urban gardeners are doing like that. Uh, anyone who's done any gardening of any scale, uh, it's, they underestimate the amount of work that it entails. And I can certainly appreciate anyone who earns a living in agriculture. Uh, Believe you me, this is this is a labor-intensive activity here, you know. Uh, but even an eight by twelve garden will keep you more than occupied, I assure you. That's why the guy had square foot gardening. I think he was trying to make it manageable, you know, and and, and cut down the amount of work here. I think it's cool you were at some sort of UN project, been been a member of the United Nations Association for a number of years. I just was at a program, I mentioned this earlier, on uh, world food supply that was at one of the universities not too long ago. And most of the world's produce is, is furnished, actually, apparently, by this type of gardening, but for, undertaken by women. Uh, I got in a little question about their solution was that women's rights <laughs> Uh, were the solution to world hunger issues. And uh, I said, listen, if, if I had to supply food for a large number of people, I said, the first thing I would want is a tractor. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a human. I realized where they were going on this incipient agriculture type thing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'd want a small scale tractor, I assure you. Uh, and you can keep. You know, I guess, you know, what are you going to do? Get the women in, um, in case to it. Now, um, the one thing about agriculture, and some of the things about growing your own food, though, and this dates back many, many years, is that you actually pay more for the can than conceivably the corn that goes inside of it. Now, that may be the economics of agriculture and some of the things we were getting into on agri business. Not to get my friend Beverly and a few of you upset, I don't know if the GMO issue has quite been settled yet. Um, what the effects are, I was curious if there were any hybrid seeds that were suited to urban growth, perhaps because of sunlight issues. Actually, I was trying to convince my neighbor, he was planting, he, and most of my sister came. He was planting tulips in a gangway. And I said, well, these are sunlight light plants. <laughs> you know, and they don't grow with 
dimwit situations. But these are some of the issues you have to probably deal with. Your people are probably experts on this. Um, you talked there about something about sedentary life. There's nothing wrong with a sedentary lifestyle. As a federal employee, I... <laughs> oh, you've got to get up and get away from your computer. No. <laughs> there is absolutely nothing wrong with so sedentary occupations or lifestyles. I perceive that. Uh, another aspect, I wasn't into producing food, but I actually did have a project. I may take this up again. But I discovered that there, we got plenty of time. Uh, I discovered that there were about 40,000 vacant lots at the time in the city of Chicago. And I was going to undertake a project to have these, unlike your, your gardening thing, but I was going to turn them all into butterfly gardens. And I actually was researching all the seed companies to put together uh, packets of the most desirable flowers that butterflies like oh. and things like that. I actually wrote about 80 seed distributors. Um, one of the other things about agriculture that's always amazed me is why we are planting corn for the purpose of producing oil, but I'm going to leave that up to my friend here who's going to talk in, in two weeks on oil, um, but to me it's just inconceivable that we're doing this. This, this is just, an, I, I can't fathom this. Um, uh, last of all, there's some talk here about bees. and. There, we've had some people here talk about nutrition, and my coworker Bob attended the college complexes, and the speaker recommended honey. Well, Bob, whose email address is vegan forever, <laughs> took immediately upon Monday to convince me that this was totally erroneous and honey was absolutely no good for you. And he even got to the point that for weeks afterwards, every Thursday or Friday, he would photocopy articles off the internet of the evils of consuming honey so I could distribute them at our literature table and save all of you from the perils of consuming honey. <laughs> but anyhow, okay. uh, what do you mean okay? We're in no hurry here. I'm about done anyway, but thank you very much. It was kind of interesting. Um, more involved in the uh, politics from the, the grower's perspective, uh, the politics of agriculture and food. I like your comment there that you vote by what you eat. Uh, I do bother a lot of people that they don't eat exploitation food. Uh, you know, I prefer to have, I don't like to have exploitation food myself, so maybe I might take up this gardening. Anyhow, thank you very much. Next. Go ahead, Ed. Now, what's your hurry, buddy? Is there any time left? Oh, plenty of time. 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, just a couple of comments. Thanks so much for your, your talk, your time, for what you and your friends do. Um, you know, in this country, we have, a, we have a philosophy, a legal philosophy that applies to people, innocent until proven guilty. And it's served us very well. But We've taken that philosophy and extended it to chemistry, to chemicals, to things, so that um, insecticides or tobacco is innocent until proven guilty. And when we try to prove it guilty, there's a whole industry up against us that are like, no, not really, it's not quite certain. Um, you know, we're stuck with this history, but um, I don't, um, I, it does, does cause me to shake my head. Um, <coughs> right now there's a, um, 
there's an algae bloom developing in uh, Lake Erie, and they're expecting that the city of Cleveland will once again have to import water. And the reason for the algae bloom is simply, one, warmer temperatures, and two, all of the runoff from the farms that run into the lake and Lake Erie is a pretty shallow and not a fast moving lake. And they come up to the farmers and they're like, it's you guys, you're doing this. And to a person, the farmers are like, nope, not me. I know it's, I know it's you know, uh, fertilizers, but it's not mine. Do you think that I would apply more fertilizer than I need? Do you think that it's a good business practice for me to apply more fertilizer than I need? No. I'm a good farmer. It's the guy next door. And we have this thing about innocent until proven guilty. And it's really done us well. But, you know, not always. Not always. Many, many things are gained. Um, there was a... A happening, an event that uh, Linda and I no, participated no in or attended that was um, at the Harold Washington, at the Cultural Center about two years ago now. And on it, it was about food. Uh, someone had made a movie, and uh, the, it was the showing of the movie, its world premiere. And basically, this fellow's philosophy was um, vote with your pocketbook. And that is turning out to be so effective. Right now, McDonald's is struggling. The cereal companies are struggling because people are voting with their pocketbooks. They're not, they're not going to these places. They're buying more healthy foods. They're requiring more healthy foods. So the very little act you can do of voting with your pocketbook adds up. It's a very effective strategy. <laughs> it's a very effective strategy. So um, it's something we can all do, you know. Thank you. All right. Well, Charlie, I think you just hit the jackpot. Yes, because I know right now that I'm all for the environmentalist movement. I'm all for clean power, agriculture, and of course things like industrialization, cheap energy, and the like. Because whatever you're talking about here with the Industrial Revolution, with the Clean Gardening Acts that we're doing, the more way of life of people around the world, you're gonna to have to realize one thing. People want power. They want cheap power. And I know there's been a lot of talk of renewables and many of the other types of alternative energy, but based on my own calculations, that ain't gonna cut it to get off oil. The only real sustainable way to get off oil or any of these new manifestations of you know agriculture or other items are going to require a tremendous amount of energy and the only way that i can really see future forward is the new generation four reactors that are on the drawing boards and some have been even working you many of you know my propensity for an element called thorium, which I believe could be used in a sustainable way with a lot of low waste in what we call the liquid molten salt reactor. They actually had one running in the 1960s under the, under the guidance of a gentleman by the name of Alvin Weinberg. Well, now a little personal pursuit as to why I support this. I have been interested in energy and energy development and sustainable practices and environmentalism since the 1970s. I have been searching for many, many years about what it's going to take to get our power in here. And when I saw a little diagram of a hand with a marble in it, about the size or about the golf ball size of metal, 
and a guy tells me, yes, this would be using a thorium-based reactor that, about, that something about the size of this could produce your entire energy output for an entire lifetime, to me, finally sounded crazy. Is that guy still alive? Yes, more, more, Charlie. Elvin Weinberg lived to an age of about 87. He was the first gentleman who developed the basic light water reactor that we believe in today. He then also went on to develop the molten salt reactor and the project at Oak Ridge that was canceled by the Nixon administration in 1973. And he was the one person who was fired by the Atomic Energy Commission, specifically a gentleman by the name of Chet Holyfield, who had a lot of power in Congress. Well, if this nuclear power reactor is so bad, why don't you just leave the industry? Well, the thing was, was that that very inventor of the light water reactor, who worked very well with Admiral Rickover in getting the first one done in the atomic submarine, and then, of course, at shipping port, then he worked on for almost uh, 6,000 hours to get his reactor running. And he, after inventing what he thought was a good one to an even better machine, to me was something we had to listen to. I mean, you know, it's kind of funny that, you know, I see a little rock of, of uh, thorium and it can save the planet and it can be sustainably done. It could eliminate our nuclear waste. And the next thing somebody's going to tell me, hey, dude, what have you been smoking? <laughs> Almost sounds sort of like a, one of these 60s co-ops that are kind of crazy. I'll make the story short. I'm heading to the Alternative Energy Show to see what is coming up with solar and wind and whatever, just to see, you know, maybe I'm wrong about my potential for power. But I do know one thing. When you have a dam the size of uh, Hoover Dam, and all that power output used for it would only run four data centers by a company like Facebook. That simply tells me we're going to need a lot more power. The only other thing is how many of you guys have smartphones in the room? Did you realize that in the aggregate, when you take all the servers, all the uh, infrastructure involved, in the aggregate, that smartphone consumes about as much power as a refrigerator. And that means when you're talking about the, the server farms, there is a, anyway, I'm starting to ramble. I believe that we're, our future in energy and with agriculture is going to be powered by cheaper, more reliable nuclear power. Thank you. Can I add one comment? Go up and say your comments, Charlie. Oh, I had to say from here. Can I? I, I was at Oak Ridge. Go can ahead. I, can I? I'd like to make a comment too. Yeah. After oh, Charlie well, gets yeah. done. Go ahead. Let's get up I here. I was on hand to see you. Uh, <laughs> I, I've had occasion to be at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I have relatives in Knoxville, but it singularly amazed me that it's still on display today. I verified it with my relatives, but as a very young man of about ten years old. They had a piece of chicken that they had fried, and it was on display. <laughs> and they were claiming that it didn't rot or anything. <laughs> it had been there for 10 years. Now, this is the, the kind of thinking. And they were saying this was the wonderful things that they were working on at this, this place here. I mean, I mean can you imagine getting a bucket of Colonel Santa and, and consuming this stuff? <laughs> and they think this is food with no, no harmful effects. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Actually, the other thing is Brad Little, who's not here tonight, was at Oak Ridge and he took one look at the place and what they were doing down there. And he, on the spot, decided to protest it and was arrested for what the, what they were doing down there. That's my chicken. Yeah. My chicken. Okay. Yeah. Dennis?
And I'm Dennis Nelson. I'm Vice President of the Nuclear Energy Information Service, Illinois Nuclear Power Watchdog Group. Normally, I don't give a second rebuttal. I thought that the rebuttal that I gave uh, in response to uh, Jessica's excellent presentation was great on urban agriculture. However, whatever the topic is, Tim always wants to get into the thorium business, whether that's directly or indirectly connected. So this is my kind of response. Again, those of you that were here know that I debated John Kutch of the Thorium Energy Alliance here, um, April 18th for a uh, birthday uh, presentation. Um, there's a lot of hype about thorium, the stuff that was said about nuclear power being too cheap to meter, and now thorium being the so-called super fuel horse crap. And I showed that, again, thorium is fertile, not fissionable. It can't sit in a reactor core and generate any electricity by itself because it needs a jump start from some other radionucleotide, rather mm -hmm. if it's uranium-235 or even plutonium. The point is, there's a lot of hype about uh, thorium. Uh, Arnie Gunderson, those of you, I don't know if you know him, he's a former nuclear engineer who's turned solar and wind advocate. We at NEIS had a, a reception for him at the Chicago Sierra Club office. Right. And after his excellent presentation, in fact, he was debating somebody um, later that week from uh, Argonne National Laboratory at Northwestern <laughs> University. I mentioned the debate on thorium. And old Arnie chuckles. And he goes, it's just like a religion. And that's precisely what my conclusion is. We're on the same page. It's this, the god of thorium religion is going to save us. And come on, Tim. That's the same kind of stuff that I listened to back that the 50s, the 60s, and early 70s, all the hype about nuclear power. Thorium will not eliminate the waste problem. It will not eliminate the proliferation problem. You're going to have both of those. It's going to be a tempting target for terrorist attacks. And it's probably going to be more expensive than the renewables and efficiency that you constantly um, valuable. Please go out to the renewable, oh, rena please go out to the Illinois Renewable Energy Fair but go with an open mind and see what's, what's happening right now. Because my conclusion is, and EIS's conclusion is, that all this thorium business is just a waste of time, a waste of money. It's either uh, a, a, an unnecessary distraction or a necessary impediment. That's what it is. Nuclear power is not necessary. We need to go carbon free, nuclear free. We need to use energy far more efficiently combined heat and power, otherwise known as cogeneration, and appropriate renewable energy technologies. Thanks a lot. All right. I would first of all like to thank our speaker for a very effective presentation. And for you, Tim, Dennis is more equipped than I am to repeat what you have to say. And I will add to what Dennis said, that when I was growing up, I spent part of my childhood in Evanston. And while I was living there, that's when Commonwealth Edison built the Zion nuclear power plant. As I've said before, they promised us years and years of cheap electricity. Those of you who grew up in that era remember the commercials that Commonwealth Edison used to run on television. Yeah, that's right. Little Bill with the light bulb and the bird face and the feet and so on. And he told us how much better things would be electrically. Little Bill! Well, it ain't so little now, folks. Uh, the bill has gone up for Commonwealth Edison's electric charges time and time again. Um, nuclear power did not make it, it did not help make it cheaper. And if anything, it made it more expensive due to the nature of the infrastructure and due to all the prop, the technical problems with, which, uh, with nuclear power, with which Dennis is more familiar than I. Thank you. Next. All right, I think that's it. Our speaker just had to excuse herself. She had to go. Remember that, Tim? Little oh. Bill. So I think we're done. All right. Uh, oh, <laughs> well, let's. Uh, well, thank you all for coming, and Godspeed. And I hope that uh, we will see you 
Yeah. In future meetings. I don't think she had anything to say.